Hi friends, welcome back to Flipside Fluent. I am Gabby. And I'm Georgia. And today we're joined by a really lovely guest, Emma Camp. She's a coral biologist and marine biogeochemist. Um, and we discussed a few things. So. Yeah, we chatted about climate change, reef conservation, and the future trajectory of the Great Barrier Reef, which was so much fun. Yeah. Um, it was different for us, but a really, really cool chat. Quite heart-wrenching as well, to be yeah. honest. I think um, taking the time to actually speak to someone who is fully aware, and that's their field of expertise, you just learn a lot. And there was definitely a lot of impactful stuff that she said and some great messages in there about what we can do and the trajectory of the Great Barrier Reef. So it's really good. Enjoy yeah. this episode, guys. Bye. <laughs> Hi, Emma. Thank you so much for coming on today. Um, before, Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> um, do you mind letting us know a bit about what you do and um, when and how your love of reefs began? Yeah, so I'm a marine biologist here. At, uh, I'm based in Sydney at the University of Technology. And my work basically is to try to study corals that are naturally more resilient to the stresses that we're seeing intensify for reefs under climate change. So this is warmer, more acidic, low oxygen waters. And unfortunately, they're the stresses that are intensifying under climate change. And our kind of traditional management of reefs, so things like marine parks, although very important, have never been set up to kind of try and help corals in the face of climate change. And then whilst we obviously really, really need to address, um, you know, the fossil fuel um, reliance globally, it's not happening quickly enough for coral reefs. And so we now know that um, reefs globally are going to struggle to survive into the future unless we um, aid them. And so my work is to see, well, if we look at corals that are naturally tougher to stress, can they provide us some of the answers we need to kind of help um, the reefs? And I guess then to your second point, where did my um, love for reefs come from? So I was really lucky when I was about eight years old to um, go over to the Caribbean. I'm from the UK. So um, growing up in England, there wasn't any reefs close by for me to um, experience. So I was really lucky to go over to the Caribbean and my dad took me snorkeling. And that was when I first saw a coral reef and it was just blew my mind. Like as a child, it's kind of something that you... You know, like seeing a storybook, even as an adult, I think, and, you know, this crazy underwater city with all the fish and the sharks, it was just amazing. And so I, that kind of started my love. Um, and then as I got older, I realised actually how important reefs are, how valuable they are. And then obviously that became a passion uh, for my research. It was beautiful. I love snorkeling and scuba diving as well. I really feel that. Um, uh, taking it back, what actually is a coral reef and how important are they yeah look really really important um questions so what's amazing is that um a coral is actually an animal which i think blows many people's <laughs> minds because a lot of people think you know it looks like it's actually a rock or a plant and if you think it's a plant you're not entirely wrong either so what's really cool that corals are called a, a holobiome which basically means whole biology and the reason for that is that it's an animal um, polyp um, that has these tiny microscopic algae that live inside the tissue of the coral and the algae photosynthesize and give the coral a lot of the energy it requires. Um, and then in return, the animal houses um, the algae. And then there's also like bacteria and viruses and lots of other things that all comprise the coral that you see. And what's even more fascinating is that an um, actual coral is made up of several, um, you know, it can be thousands of polyps. So they're actually like a colonial organism. And that just forms a single coral that then obviously you get lots of corals that form a coral reef. So they're really these intricate systems. And why are they important? Well, there's lots of reasons, um, starting with the fact that they obviously are really biodiverse. So they actually only cover less than 1% of the ocean floor, but house over 25% of marine life. So they're kind of like the rainforests of the sea. And to that point, they're also um, can be considered a modern day medical cabinet. So actually many pharmaceutical compounds um, that are being used in, in drugs um, and also trial drugs are actually derived from an, an organism that's found on coral reefs. And mm -hmm. um, many fish stocks are reliant on coral reefs. So fish, um, even if they don't live their whole life on a reef, spend some period of time there. 
if you're a coastal community, you're probably quite aware, um, and, and you have a reef near you, you're probably quite aware that they serve a really important function of um, dissipating wave energy. So if there's a cyclone or any big, you know, high tides, the reef's the first thing that actually stops that energy from then coming into land. And then there's a real big cultural value of reefs for many communities um, around around the world. So that's just a few, you know, of, of the values. And then I guess finally, tourism, recreation, um, you know, a lot of people spend a lot of money to go see a reef. So yeah, very important um, ecosystems. Yeah, wow. It's, it's amazing to hear about how intricate they are. Um, in terms of um, the reefs, what is the impact of losing them? So if we lose coral reefs, um, you know, not just in terms of entirely gone, but actually even if we lose a lot of the species and in turn then the functions that, that like kind of um, they provide, we run a real list risk of um, yeah all of the benefits that I've talked about being lost. But further than that, there will be knock on of like socioeconomic effect so you know if we talk about around where you know kind of the cousins of australia where i am in the pacific there's lots of island nations that um, fundamentally rely on coral reefs for survival so if you lose the reefs then all of a sudden you have environmental refugees that are going to have to move elsewhere because they've lost their food source their land is flooding and so then that will have you know wider reaching um, impacts and I think you know the other thing we have to really think about is that we can kind of think of coral reefs as the canary in the coal mine if you've heard that analogy before they're they're really the, one of the first ecosystems that visually shows us the impact that humans are having on the environment um, not just in terms of physical loss but also changing you know the chemistry and the quality of that ecosystem so again it's also um a warning sign I think to us about the bigger impacts that we're having on nature um, and in turn on our own human health if we if we lose these these important systems definitely mm. it's it's a really scary thought to see the current trajectory of the Great Barrier Reef um, how has your work um, with finding corals in like unexpected places such as mangrove mangrove lagoons and stuff like that changed the way that you see the future of the Great Barrier Reef so I would say that it gives me some cautioned um, hope. And I, I say cautioned hope because like, just to put it out there, you know, we fundamentally, if we don't deal with our reliance on, on, you know, the fossil fuels and on climate, you know, addressing climate change, then I really fear for the long-term hope of the reef. But in saying that, what my work and you know is showing is that there are corals capable of living in very tough conditions more extreme than we're predicting over the next kind of couple of hundred years under climate change but when we look at the corals that i found we see that there's a lot less biodiversity we see that they're a lot smaller and so kind of that's why it's a caution hope because if we think about those functions that i described earlier about why reefs are so important we need obviously big accreting which basically mean big you know kind of built up structures to, to break that wave energy for example so obviously if we're getting smaller colonies can they then actually act and, and provide those services that we need it's not as much home for the fish life etc etc so the work that i'm doing is providing me some hope that there will be the capacity for some corals to survive into the future, but without addressing, you know, climate change, I worry that um, it will be an unrecognisable reef. Mm. And wow. Yeah, it's crazy. And um, with bleached corals, are they, once they've been bleached, are they permanently lost or can they rejuvenate or...? Yeah, this is a really good a good question. Um, so actually, when a coral's bleached, it's not dead at that point in time. So if we go back to what a coral is, it's got those microalgae within its tissue. When there's a stress event, and typically it's warmer waters, the algae actually um, are expelled from the coral because they actually become toxic under extreme stress. Mm -hmm. And that basically loss of, of the algae is also the loss of primary color that you see with corals and so then you see the white skeleton underneath the coral tissue hence why we say the coral is bleached mm -hmm. now if that stress event then is short-lived the coral is still alive it can actually re reacquire 
the microalgae and recover from that bleaching event. But unfortunately, what we're seeing is that often the stress event lasts for such a long time that the coral then um, unfortunately transitions to, to mortality. Now, in saying that, if there is long enough um, periods of time between these big stress events, so kind of we're talking like decades or more, then we know that reefs can recover even if there's a really severe impact. Well, what's scary is that we're actually seeing these stress events occurring sometimes back to back years. So the Great Barrier Reef, we've seen three bleaching events in the last five years. This is unprecedented. We haven't documented anything like this before. And that's just compromising the resilience of the reef to deal with stress because you're eroding the number of corals and the diversity of corals and basically the ability of, of the system to bounce back from stress. Wow. Yeah. You've mentioned global warming quite a bit. Um, yes. I'd love to know what are the biggest factors influencing the well-being of the reefs? And um, kind of off the back of that, what has been done and what else needs to be done? Yeah, look, great question. So, um, you know, the, the reef, I guess, has got a lot of pressures on it. And um, the biggest one um, is the stresses of climate change and it actually unesco just released um, a report a couple of days ago saying that um, the, you know the status of the great barrier reef for example is now at critical levels um, and that's the primary reason for that was climate change so again it's not um it's not i guess just my opinion on, on that being kind of the big stress on the reef and so when 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 we say that, what, what does that actually mean? Well, it means that the warmer waters are threatening corals via bleaching. It means that the oceans are becoming more acidic, which compromises the, the ability of reefs to build their structure. And also um, it compromises the um, ability of reefs to potentially deal with kind of erosion so actually the the calcium carbonate structure that reefs form is a bit like chalk it's a chalky structure um and so it can actually be susceptible to to erosion um, and then things like low oxygen levels increasing storm intensity that can physically damage the reef are all predicted to intensify with climate change then on top of that, you add in stresses that are local. So for example, in the Caribbean, you have invasive lionfish that um, are decimating a lot of the fish populations. You may have changes in land use and runoff, which are causing pollution. So there's, depending kind of on where the reef is based, there are different local stresses. And then obviously the impacts of climate change are being felt by reefs um, globally. And then I guess to your second point, what's being done? again this varies um depending on on where you are um quite frankly not enough has been done collectively on um climate change and you know yes you know, I, I keep going back to it but it's because i you know the reality is that if we are not dealing with it um we may not have coral reefs you know at the end of the century that's kind of the reality of, of where we're where we're at um but you know, in saying that, I I am, am actually, and, and people maybe after hearing me speak may be surprised, but I am an ocean optimist, despite, you know, um, despite the negativity I may sometimes <laughs> convey. And the reason for that is that we still have um, amazing coral reefs globally. And the reason for that is because they've been well managed uh, on a local level with things like marine protected areas. And um, if we take the Great Barrier Reef, where I'm, you know, kind of um, spend most of my time now is um, we're now at a point where we need like a toolbox approach to managing the reef. So if you think about, you know, if you spring a leak in your house, a wrench may be the best tool that you have to deal with that. For us, having um, addressing climate change is that. But if obviously you don't have that wrench, you don't just let it keep pouring water over your floor. You then say, okay, well, I've got this smaller spanner and I've got some duct tape and I've got a screwdriver and you kind of try all of those other things, right, to stop the leak or to buy you time that's exactly what we're doing with the science now so it's saying what other actions do we have that can buy us time to get you know policy to where it needs to be so that's things like restoration activities can we grow corals up and replant them on the reef to try and build the natural resilience can we look at things like assisted evolution so can we actually kind of manipulate corals in a lab um, and if necessary replant them to try and boost um, their abundance 
uh, things like there's actually chemicals that are being used to try to kind of a chemical sunscreen, if you like, to try to, during a bleaching event, reduce light intensity, which can antagonize the stress. So there's lots of things being trialed here. Um, but we're, you know, obviously hopeful that we don't need to use a lot of them. Um, because I think if we look collectively, uh, humans have not always been the best when they start intervening with nature because nature is very good at doing what it does without us um, sometimes getting involved. Yeah, definitely. In terms of um, restoration, how long does it take for a coral to regrow and then be planted? So this is what's really cool about corals. So if you imagine like you've got a plant and you take a, a clipping of that plant, so genetically it's exactly the same in, and then you just, you know, repot it and it grows, you know, depending on the plant, surprisingly quickly. And corals are exactly the same. So if we take, um, you know, a, a fast growing species, so they're like your branching corals tend to be the, the fastest growers. If we take, say, a five centimetre fragment and I put it onto a rack to grow, um, we can see actually that, you know, for some of the species, they can get to kind of close to like a basketball size within a year, which is really um like amazing and surprising and what's been actually really exciting for us is actually as we speak um not in the day but the, over this weekend at night the corals are actually spawning on the great bear reef at the moment and in one of our coral nurseries that we have on the great bear reef we've um taken some small kind of fragments off the end of some of the colonies and we can see that they've actually got eggs um in them in our nursery so we know that within kind of a year some of those that we've put on there have not only grown large but they've grown to a capacity where they can then reproduce and that's really the ultimate goal of restoration mm -hmm. is that you've got corals that are self-sustaining and um, so that's super exciting but again if you've got you know some other corals could take kind of years and years to get to that to that size so it really depends on the species but for some it's, it can be relatively quick yeah wow i have a a question that i don't know if it's true or false so <laughs> i feel like you would be able to answer this one is it true that if you touch a coral, it dies? Because it's it's definitely not true that it dies. <laughs> dies but, um, but I like that because we should just tell everybody that because then they won't be, you know, um, wanting to touch it. So that would be great. <laughs> but where, I guess where that could be, you know, where that could potentially be true is that, you know, we have bacteria and pathogens and things on our hands that the coral is just not used to. So mm -hmm. if you touch a coral, you could basically be introducing some germs that they're not um, able to survive and to tolerate. So again, it's always, you know, it's always a good idea, like <laughs> don't touch coral, definitely not advocating it, but it, but yeah, it's it's very unlikely it would <laughs> die unless you've got some crazy thing going on through your hands. <laughs> so, so other than not touching coral, how can we conserve the reef? So, you know, this is what's amazing is, is that we, even if we're nowhere near a reef, we've all got the capacity to kind of contribute to its long-term future by looking at actions that are going to reduce our impacts on the climate and on the environment. So, you know, if we think about the fact that we make thousands of decisions every day, all of those decisions are directly impacting uh, impacting nature. So if we can you know, and a lot of people have probably heard a lot of these things, but, um, you know, reduce the amount of times, you know, you use your car, you know, eating less meat, being more sustainable with your clothing, all of those things have a direct impact on the environment and on the reef because it's reducing, you know, the kind of climatic pressures that they're facing. Um, I also, you know, really encourage people um, to use their votes um, wisely, especially the younger generation that we're, we're the we're the generation that are going to be inheriting the planet that is left to us. Um, and so, you know, we want to ensure that that's the highest quality that it can be. And um, so, you know, just educate yourself on, you know, the, the, the problems, but also know what your local representatives and national representatives stand on these environmental issues, because it's so important for our future that they take it seriously. And it's not something that is kind of low down the list to other maybe short term financial gains. Um, and then also, I guess, the more kind of hands on is that if people, you know, want to get involved in volunteer projects, or, you know, actually go and experience the reef and 
kind of speak to you know local researchers or conservation groups that often have opportunities for people then again that's another way if you're lucky enough to live near a reef and um, i'm sure people would love um, any involvement that that people might want to bring yeah that's so awesome you mentioned um that this is the planet that younger generations are going to be inheriting um, and so we're the ones that really need to step up. I think that that's such a lovely point because seeing our generation at the moment and seeing everyone really like get active and use their voices, um, even just with social media, I feel like so much um, discussion about climate change, um, like ocean protection, reef protection, things like that are really coming up, which is so mm. awesome. Even that, that new David Attenborough documentary that was released this year so many people are talking about eating less meat um doing good things for the environment so it's just so awesome to see yeah it's definitely something that gives me you know a lot of hope i mean i went and did a session with four-year-olds on mm -hmm. um it was really cute they came into our lab mm -hmm. and um like for half a day and the questions that they had just blew me away and they were so aware of their impacts on the environment, I, like I was so much more so than I was at that age. Um, and that's one of the things that brings me immense hope. You know, I said I'm, I'm an ocean optimist and, and a big reason for that is that the, uh, I really feel that, you know, the, the younger generation, even, you know, even like younger than us, um, really understand the value of the environment. And I'm just hopeful that, that kind of that, future leadership and current leadership you know there's lots of young people that are leading the charge on action um, on climate change and environmental protection is something that um we should really take a lot of solace in um, that that we will have a better future because of that definitely um what would you you say tourism um what kind of impact does that play in terms of the australian great barrier reef Look, I think historically there's been a real view that, that tourism um, is detrimental to the reef, but I think this is really quite a dated view. Um, so many of the tour operators, you know, have a not just a, a, a value of the reef because it's, it's you know, for their livelihood, but, the, the, you know, a lot of the owners are really passionate individuals that have, you know, been going to sites on the reefs for decades. So they are really, you know, some of the biggest advocates for the reef's conservation. Um, you know, obviously there's variation between operators that go out there, but there are some operators, like one of the ones we work with, Wavelength Reef Cruises, and they, you know, they now um, give, you know, they offset their, you know, carbon emissions to get out to the reef. They're active in restoration activities, as are many of the other operators now. Um, so, you know, they're really... Um, minimizing the direct impact that they're having on the reef and I and I really feel that if people have the opportunity to get out and see the reef they can understand like the fragility but uh, you know amazing biodiversity and beauty of the reef and this can in turn help them to ultimately um, value fall in love and hopefully then want to conserve it mm, definitely yeah for many people working and volunteering with different reefs what does kind of like a day in that conservation look like yeah so look it can you know i guess really depend on on where where you are but often um you know if you're out on the reef physically then often it's going to involve diving and snorkeling probably some sort of surveying so actually to get an idea of what the status of the reef is so looking at health checks or is there any bleached or pale colonies and um, what's the diversity of reefs, maybe some fish surveys. Then if there's actually active restoration going on, it's often to kind of collect some uh, stocks for the parent, you know, initial colonies and then put, putting them maybe onto frames or however they're being grown. Um, and then surveying any colonies that are in like a nursery setup. And ultimately, the ultimate goal would be to then put those back onto a reef. So maybe collecting some from the frames and putting them out. If there's science experiments going on, there may be um, sample collection to then go back onto a boat to um, store them for analysis. So this can be either freezing them or putting them in buffers. And then, you know, for individuals like myself, then that's kind of the, that's the fun part that everyone hears about. Then the reality is going back to a lab, doing things like taking, you know, doing DNA extractions and working on the physiology 
um, lots of data analysis, data writing, report writing to basically ensure that the information that's being collected is then actually translated into um, meaningful science um, and action that you know people can um, learn about and hopefully politicians can act upon the findings. Mm. Yeah, wow. Um, sorry, Zana. <laughs> um, yeah, wow. It's so interesting to hear the actual specifics of all of that. What would your one call to action be for young people um, who are interested in making change? Um, one call to action. I think my big call to action would be don't assume that somebody else is going to um solve this problem for you you know it's it's not up to the scientists it's not up to the politicians it's not up to the conservationists it's up to every individual person to to acknowledge that this is a global problem and and therefore it requires a global solution i think no matter what your career is and um, no matter what your age is we can all take actions to help better um, the future of the environment and yeah, I just encourage people to you know reflect inwardly on on their actions and, and make some you know decisions, big or small, to help conserve um, our environment. Mm, yeah, that's beautiful. I love that. Mm. In in terms of as well, not just the corals but the marine life. Um, how has that changed over like the last decade or so? Yeah, so look, if we look at the Great Barrier Reef, we know from the mid-1990s, so the last three decades, we've lost 50% of live coral cover on the reef. Um, if we say then move to the last, you know, decade, that's where we've seen, you know, about 30% of that 50% be lost. Um, and with that then comes, you know, we know that the associated fish stocks and things like that are being you know eroded down and even in the open ocean we know that global fish stocks are declining and um, this comes from the tragedy of the commons where you know it's common ownership and actually trying to kind of manage um, the ocean is very tricky because um, there's a lot of shared waters and things like that so again it, it's really unfortunately a global state of general degradation but there are areas of of hope and there are hope spots and areas where actually restoration activities um even you know mangrove restoration seagrass restoration reef restoration are having really positive effects and um, you mentioned the david attenborough show and i think one of the things i love about what he says is that you know it's not enough anymore to just manage and deal with climate change we have to now be thinking about restoring nature and i couldn't agree with that sentiment more because unfortunately it's not enough now to just try to kind of deal with with the the big impacts we now need to say okay we actually need to start aiding these systems to deal with those big impacts and that's where i think restoration does have a key um, role to play mm, definitely yeah i think it's a really important message to make sure that we are doing our part and not just trying to stop the issue but actually help bring back what once was there yeah yeah yeah, yeah definitely Thank you so much for coming on. This has been such an awesome chat. Um, something very different for us, but so, so interesting to hear about and to kind of get your perspective and your firsthand um, kind of experience on this issue. So thank you so much. We really, really appreciate it. Both and um, I'm, I'm hope that that kind of answered all of the questions <laughs> that you guys had. And um, yeah, looking forward to hear the final piece. Yeah, awesome. definitely. If people are interested in kind of looking into the work you do, where can they find you? Great. So um, I have um, Twitter, Instagram and a web page, which has got more contact information. And it's really easy. All of them are Emma, E-M-M-A, F, Camp, C-A-M-P. That so was maybe. such a lovely episode. I mean, it was so impactful. Yeah. Pretty hard hitting, to be honest, especially I think living in Australia and knowing that that is something that is a large responsibility of ours as a nation to really care for and look after. Yeah. Um, it definitely hits hard that we need a have an impact and play a bigger role in conserving the reef. Yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. George is already talking about volunteering. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was like done. Like the second she said there's volunteer opportunities, I was like, I'm booking oh that goodness. right now. It'll like, be, yeah, it'll be awesome. Yeah. yeah, so if you guys enjoyed this week's episode, please um, thumbs up, subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts. We'd love that. Yeah. yeah, definitely. We've got some great episodes coming up. Um, we're speaking to a few more friends, which is really nice yeah. to switch things up. Um, and also a few episodes of just us. So if you want to get to know us a bit more, see us chat, <laughs> give some input of our own, then yeah, keep on subscribing and watching out for us every Monday. Easy.
Take care, friends. See you in the flip side. Bye.